Welcome, everyone, to this edition of Broadcaster Hour. I'm Roger Hoover with you from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Of course, we're joined by Kyle Crooks from Gainesville, Florida. And from the Chicagoland area, we have the voice of the Chicago Cubs, Pat Hughes. And I mentioned Chicagoland. Congratulations, Pat, on being a Chicagoland Sports Hall of Famer. How's everything going? <laughs> uh, fine, Roger. Nice to be with you and Kyle. Uh, that was a, a nice award that was last autumn. And uh, I was very proud of that. And uh, things like that never uh, get old. I don't take them for granted. It was it was a special night. My wife was there with me, and uh, so was my great partner Ron Coomer and uh, Zach Zaidman, the third man in our booth. So uh, it was a special night. But nice to be with you guys. And how do you utilize the off season? You know, it's it's cold right now. These are the these, this is the time when you're you, you're dreaming of of spring training. We all know what's going on with baseball right now, and we hope we have spring training on time. But as a radio announcer. Do you utilize this time to, to stay ahead in, in your prep and things like that? How, how do you take this time away, I guess? Sure. You, you do your reading. And what I've been doing for years and years, uh, I take a manila folder. Each folder uh, belongs to one team that the Cubs are going to be playing. And I draw a baseball diamond uh, and then put in the guys who probably will be the starting players for their teams, uh, left field, right field. Uh, shortstop, second base, you know, or whatever it is. And then I start jotting down notes, um, you know, 30 home runs, 88 RBIs, whatever it was a year ago for this guy. Or if it's a new player, you can say uh, first round pick 2019, played collegiately at uh, Alabama or wherever. And uh, so that's what I do. I do a lot of preparation. So I'm ready to go whenever uh, the season gets underway. Right now, everything's kind of on hold because of the labor impasse. But here's hoping it is resolved sooner rather than later, because uh, I, I really do think the Cubs are going to continue to build the team back up and become a contender again. They made some strides before the lockout occurred, uh, picking up Wade Miley, a veteran left-handed starting pitcher who pitched very well for the Reds last year and the year before. And Marcus Stroman, uh, an excellent right-handed pitcher who performed for the Mets last year. He's been in Toronto, uh, but he's good. So you got those two guys with Kyle Hendricks. And I feel good going into any series from a Cubs standpoint if those three guys are the scheduled three starting pitchers against the Cardinals or the Brewers or the Reds or or whomever. And as a broadcaster and a major league broadcaster, you have the good years and you have the bad years and the Cubs have had their good years and they've had their not so good years. And when you're there every single day and in the, we'll, we'll talk about the lean years. So in July and August, when you're in, in last place in a division and you have to keep things interesting and man, that can, that sometimes is not easy to do. How, how did you, how do you handle those years when things aren't going well? And you can't be overly critical because you are the team guy, but you want to be realistic. Yeah, it, it's a job. Um, it's, it's plain and simple. You roll up your sleeves and you go to work just like everyone else. And you're right. It's much easier when the team is winning. Uh, you know, every game means something when you get down into the pennant race in August and September and it's exciting and you get come from behind ninth inning rallies and you beat your rivals and you're in first place and now you're going to be in the playoffs. That's great. And, and that's almost um, too good to be true because it's not going to happen all that many times. I'm going to begin my 40th year. I can't even believe I'm saying this. I'm going to begin in a month or two, my 40th consecutive season as a big league baseball announcer. One time my team went all the way and it was very memorable and extremely special when the 2016 Chicago Cubs snapped the drought of 108 years and became the world champs. And I got to be the guy to say, the Chicago Cubs win the World Series. And by the way, I never get tired of saying that. But I was the one guy that, you know, the first radio announcer ever in Cubs history who got to say those words, because back in 1908, there was no baseball on the radio. So that was very special. But you're right. It's not always going to be that way. Um, I tell young baseball announcers or people who want to be a baseball announcer, the first thing is you better love the game. You better love the game of baseball, the history of the game, 
because the team you're covering is not always going to be in the in the middle of the pennant race. They're going to be in last place. And I've seen both. I've seen first place and last place and everywhere in between. But even when they're in last place, you have to just treat each game like a separate entity. You prepare. You prepare notes on the pitchers, the everyday players. Uh, you prepare. Uh, the, one of the cool things about being a radio man in baseball is that each game is sort of preparation for the next game and so on and so on. Uh, for example, you get to game two of the series. It's the Cubs and the Reds. We're at the Great American Ballpark in Cincinnati. Small crowd here on this uh, September evening in Ohio. But last night, the Cubs rallied in the eighth inning with four runs to turn one around and beat the Reds six to five. The Reds are a contender this year. The Cubs are not, but it was a sweet win for the Cubs. So game two, here we go. Uh, whatever the, I'm, I'm just obviously making all this up. But whatever happened uh, in yesterday's game is preparation for today's game. And it's just an ongoing process like that. So you treat each, each game like a separate entity. You still try to have fun. You try to tell stories. I try to tap into my great partner, Ron Coomer, and get his knowledge on the air. Zach Zaidman is an excellent third man in our booth. He's very much um, engaged. And we, we do a lot of things on Cubs radio uh, that is probably different than the average broadcast. But I never set out to try to be like everyone else. That never interested me uh, at all. I wanted to be myself. And if that was a little bit unusual, you embrace your individuality and embrace your independence. And thankfully, what I've done has been accepted by Cub fans and by the people that pay my salary and they let me do my thing. So I love the game. I love the language. I love performing. I love the fact that it's extemporaneous and ad libbing. Uh, it's a difficult job. Not many people can do this uh, or, you know, and I'm not boasting or anything, but again, it's my 40th year in the big leagues, my 27th here in Chicago. I must be doing something right. You certainly are serving Cub fans extremely well, baseball fans for now 40 years. But let's go back and take a look back at the first steps you took in this business. And we could take forever talking about uh, your career, the different twists and turns it's had. But when did you catch that sports casting bug? And what were the first steps you tried to take towards having a career in this industry? Well, I'll tell you, Roger and Kyle, I think that uh, like every other kid who loves sports, I wanted to be a big league ball player or an NBA shooting guard. Or a, or a quarterback in the NFL. And I played all the sports um, up until high school. Then I played basketball. I was lucky enough to be on a, a good team and, and I made all conference. And then I played one year of college basketball and I still shoot baskets from my workout. Okay, my, it's, it's a long story, but my exercise every other day, this is before the pandemic hit, would be to shoot 150 shots and jog to the other end after every shot. I love shooting. Love the game. Love to watch Steph Curry of the Golden State Warriors play, among other guys. But anyway, uh, so I loved playing and I love playing baseball. I was on championship little league teams. I was lucky enough to be all conference in high school in that. I played in the Colt League World Series back in 1971. I was never big enough. I'm, I'm very slender. I wanted to be a quarterback and I played up until eighth grade. I played quarterback but um, didn't play high school tackle football, but I loved sports. And so I wanted to go into sports. I knew that from the time I was eight or nine years old. And I was the kind of kid that every single day in the summer, you didn't have to tell me to you know, go practice baseball. I felt like it was part of my job. I loved playing baseball. I got on my little bicycle, called a bunch of buddies. Hey, let's be at the park at nine o'clock. I'll see you there. And we would play all day. We'd maybe take a little break for lunch and then play after lunch. It was like a full-time gig and nobody was paying you, but I love playing ball. So um, when I got to be about 17, 18, I realized I was not going to be physically gifted enough to be a player. So I thought that being maybe a play-by-play -play announcer would be the next best thing. And I'm here to tell you that after all these years, I still feel that exact same way. Being a play-by-play -play announcer, and I started doing it in college, but my goal in college was to become 
and again, this sounds kind of um, grandiose, but I wanted to be the voice of one of the great American sports franchises, whether it was football, basketball, or baseball. I didn't play hockey growing up in San Jose, California, but those were my three, football, basketball, baseball. I wanted to be the great a voice of one of those great franchises. And we know what they are, and I don't want to leave any teams out, but let's just take, I mentioned Steph Curry, let's take the NBA. Boston Celtics, Los Angeles Lakers, Chicago Bulls, Golden State Warriors, San Antonio Spurs, New York Knicks, you know, there might be another one or two in there, but those would be the, quote, great American sports franchises. When I got the job with the Cubs, I had achieved my goal of becoming that voice, and I have held on to that job as tightly as I possibly could. I don't take any game lightly. I prepare. I have fun. I perform the best that I possibly can each day. And again, I'm blessed with great partners and good people to work for. They give me total freedom to do my job. And it's really, it's really worked out that way. But it goes way back to when I was a little guy, eight or nine years old, playing ball, wanting to be a player, and then realizing realistically when I was 18 or so that I was not going to be a player. So, okay, let's go to plan B. And plan B was being a broadcaster. And here I am. And I grew up a big Cubs fan in Tennessee, WGN. I was able to watch Harry Carey and Steve Stone. They were my de facto babysitters as I was growing up as an only child. And I didn't get to listen to you and Ron until later with the advent of internet radio. But I've heard you talk about in 1996, you make the transition from Milwaukee to Chicago and some key people helped welcome you to the Chicago Cubs. What can you tell us about forming that relationship with Ron Sano and especially Harry Carey and the way he welcomed you to Chicago? Both of them did, uh, Roger and Kyle, you're right. And I will never forget it. I'm grateful to both of them. Uh, Ronnie uh, Sato, um, in particular, he knew I was very nervous. I got hired in November of 1995, long time ago. You guys were probably, I don't even know if you guys were born at that time, <laughs> but it was uh, uh, 27 years ago this November. And um, uh, I got hired. I was the number two guy in Milwaukee working with Bob Euchre. And now I went from one of the smallest broadcast markets, Milwaukee, to Chicago, one of the biggest. So a major transition. I went from doing three innings of play-by-play -play on Brewer Radio to doing all nine innings. And I did, if you guys can imagine, you guys are in broadcasting. I did every inning of every game for the Cubs for about the first nine or 10 years. And I did not miss a game. And in my 26 years, I think I've missed about five games because of injury or illness. I'm very proud of that, but I, I try to take care of myself. Anyway, Ron Sato knew that I was uptight. He could just tell, I mean, I was, I was 40 years old. It's not like I was a kid. But he knew that I was, I was um, uh, feeling some anxiety, as anybody would. You know, when you become the voice of the Cubs, going to a new market is both exciting and terrifying. You don't know if the audience is going to welcome you or receive you or like you at all. So, but the, the night before, I'll never forget this, the night before the first exhibition game in the spring of 1996, Ron Santo calls me at the little condo where I was staying in Arizona. And he said, Pat, I know you're nervous, but you don't have to be. He says, you're a great announcer. You're gonna be great. I'm gonna do the color. We're gonna have fun. We're gonna laugh. We're gonna talk baseball. You just be yourself and everything's gonna work out great. And I, I almost had tears on my eyes and I almost do right now, just thinking about how kind and how generous that was of Ron to do that, because it's amazing. I was nervous, but as soon as I hung up the phone after that conversation, I felt no anxiety, none whatsoever. I had a good night's sleep, showed up the next day, didn't feel nervous. We did the first half inning. I remember Frank Castillo was pitching for the Cubs. The Seattle Mariners loaded the bases with nobody out. He gets out of the jam. It's a long half inning. So I'm working with Ronnie and we're talking about pitches and plays and, and we were laughing and I could tell right away there was chemistry. And at the end of the half inning, 
Uh, I still remember there was a pop out to Mark Grace in foul territory. Castillo gave up no runs. And at the end of a half inning, Mariners nothing and the Cubs coming up. We go to a commercial. Ron Santo stands up. He's got this smile on his face like a little 10 year old kid thinking, oh boy, this is going to be great. He stands up and shakes my hand and he's smiling. And I thought, this is going to be a great partnership. And, and it was for 15 years. They called it the Pat and Ron show. So anyway, Ronnie was a very special person to me. And even though he's been gone now for 12 years, he still remains a very special person. Harry Carey, also about a month into my time as the voice of the Cubs, one day on a Sunday, Cubs are playing the Mets. And he comes over to the booth and he's he's chit-chatting for a minute or two on the air with Ronnie and me, uh, Santo. And he says, now, Pat, I want you to know the real reason I came over. I just want you to know that everyone loves the work you are doing. You and Ron, it sounds great. And I just want you to keep on doing it. And I mean, I didn't ask him to do that. He and And Harry, I know, was tough on a lot of people that he worked with, not with me. He was great to me. He knew that I love baseball, that I respected him and his wonderful career. Uh, but he went out of his way that day to welcome me. And whenever somebody of great stature in the existing city goes out of their way to welcome you, the audience naturally thinks, well, if this guy's okay with Ron Santo, and if this guy's okay with Harry Carey, he's okay with me. So, you know, those were, those were two things that I'll never forget. Uh, Ron Sato and Harry Carey. And, and we laugh too every day. Yeah, and those are great stories and just the weight lifted off your shoulders. And, and how yeah. about, you know, the weight that's put on your shoulders when this team's making that world championship run and you're in the world series and now you have to deliver that call and what was such a crazy uh, a game in, in which the Cubs won that world series. And you can tell that, you didn't have anything. You didn't have anything scripted. Like you, you were in the moment, and, and that's how everybody says you should do it. What were you feeling? It, you know, how how's how's the anxiety in that moment? Making sure that you want to capture that for decades and decades of Cubs fans. Well, um, you know, sometimes in life you only get one shot. You get one take, and, and that was the ultimate one shot moment in my broadcasting career. So um, let, let's, you know, people said, did you plan out what you were going to say? No, I knew roughly what I wanted to say, but I'm a radio man. You have to be honest to your radio announcer, uh, your radio uh, audience, first and foremost. So let's say you did plan out something. Um, you, you planned out something real clever and cutesy and you know, memorable to say when the Cubs won the World Series. But I've, I've done baseball for a long time. A baseball game can end in any number of different ways. It can end on a strikeout, a game-winning homer, a throwing error, a wild pitch, a, a double play, a, a, a single down the right field line, a roller up the middle, a blooper into left center, whatever. So, and, and also the score of a game can be any, any number of different combinations. Let's say you've got a nail biter like we did have the Cubs and the Indians in game seven back in 2016, where it's just back and forth and crazy. And it was like a movie. It had drama and the unexpected. And then, you know, the ultimate victory at the end, it was wonderful. But if it was an 11 to nothing Cubs lead at that time, and you had something real fancy to say, it might have been totally inappropriate. Um, it might have fit the cliffhanger, but it would not have been good for an 11 nothing game. So I decided I'm going to be true to the last call, first and foremost. And it, as I listened to that, uh, I said a bouncer, a little bouncer slowly toward Bryant. And I thought, I'm very proud I said that. I was concentrating so intensely that, you know, that's exactly what it was. It was a bouncer slowly toward Bryant. He will glove it and throw to Rizzo, and I had to wait. Joe West was umpiring at first. You don't want to jump the gun on that one. It was a high throw. Rizzo had to reach up and flag it down. Then I saw Joe West, the umpire, give the, the pump with the fist. 
It's in time. And the Chicago Cubs win the World Series. And then I saw these guys just pouring out of the dugout. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw Ben Zobrist in left field. They had a camera shot of him as he comes running in. And he, he jumped in the air. If you ever see it, it's almost funny. He jumps in the air. His legs and arms are going in four different directions. And I, I almost laughed out loud when I saw it because I said, the Cubs come pouring out of the dugout. And then I saw Ben jumping up and down like a bunch of delirious 10-year-olds. The Cubs have done it. And then there is a line that I had planned, not word for word, but I did say, the longest drought in the history of American sports is over and the celebration begins. And, and then I was just quiet for a minute. But also I wanna share with you, uh, you guys can relate, relate to this being in the business. The morning of game seven, a sponsor, an insurance company, calls the radio station and says, we are going to pay you a, a lot of money. I, I'm not going to share exactly how much it was. That's private information. But they said, we will pay you thousands of dollars. Let's just say that. If you can get Pat Hughes to read this commercial within 30 seconds of the Cubs winning, if, if you agree to have him do it, we'll pay it. So obviously the station contacted me and said, Pat, would you please do it? Yes, I'm an employee. I do what I'm told. So no matter what I was going to say after the final out, it had to be within that 30 second window because I had to be done and read the commercial within 30 seconds or else the deal was off. So that was another thing that just added to the, not anxiety, but just added to the complicated moment of my life that that turned out to be but again it, it turned out well I wouldn't change a thing I am I'm glad I was able to deliver and, and there were certain things that I you know you think about a lot of things you think about your voice cracking you know sometimes your voice just cracks you know pass the butter <clears throat> excuse me pass the butter <laughs> and I did not want that to happen in the final out of the world series so I, I, I was saying you know, stay under control. You don't want to sound like a an eighth year an eighth grader, and you don't want to be out of control. And you know, let's let's be mature. Let's let's sound under control. I didn't want it to be about me. I didn't want it to be something that people would say. Well, he's just grandstanding, and it's all about him. No, this is about the Cubs. It's about the Cubs winning the World Series. It's about them ending this drought of 108 years. Let's make the call. Let's do the best we can. And again, it's not the greatest call that's ever been made. Don't get me wrong. It's not even close to that. But it was the best that I could do at that moment. And I can live with it. That is such an interesting wrinkle that you have to get ad copy in within 30 seconds. <laughs> I, I almost somebody of your stature, I'm surprised you didn't say, you know what, this is too big of a moment to let's let's just kind of leave it to to what's happening. But let, let me ask you this, because I'm sure you get a lot of tapes all the time and a lot of people reaching out to you for what you think is, is good in baseball radio play by play specifically. So when you pop in a tape or you're, or you're driving in the car and you're listening, what makes really good baseball play by play on the radio to you where you say, you know what? Yeah, that, this is this is what I want to hear. Well, I, I interviewed the great Vince Scully one time on a, <clears throat> there was my voice cracking right there. I, I interviewed the great Vince Scully one time and I said, uh, Vin, a hundred years from now, when people pull out recordings of your work, what do you want them to, to think and feel? And he said, well, I want them to think that I was accurate and that I was fair. And boy, if you start with that foundation right there, be accurate and be fair and then be prepared, um, you know, so th those, are, those are the first. The great Arnie Harwell told me that there are four things that a baseball announcer should be and should have. He should have the reflexes of a ball player. He should have the enthusiasm of a fan. He should have the impartiality of an umpire and the background knowledge of a writer. A lot going on in those four things. Again, reflexes of a player, enthusiasm of a fan, impartiality of an umpire, and background knowledge of a writer. So if you go with accurate and fair, and then those four things, that gives you a pretty good foundation. 
but you have to have a nice voice. You have to have a pleasant manner. You cannot be an annoying person. And I'm, I'm not saying that I'm not annoying. Sometimes I'm, I'm sure my wife of 34 years would tell you, <laughs> would tell you that I can be annoying. Um, but you have to wear well on your audience if you're going to be a radio man, because as you guys mentioned earlier, you're on there every single day for three to four hours a day. Um, you have to have a sense of humor, I think, uh, to get through the games where it's 11 to one in the fifth inning. You can't just go ball one, strike one. If it's 11 to one, you have to branch out. You have to, I, I, I love this date in baseball history. I have a great partner, Ron Coomer. We do uh, technique all the time. Why did that play work, Ronnie? Why didn't it work? Um, so, you know, there's no one way to do it, but those are some of the thoughts that, that I always um, bring into mind. Be prepared. Uh, certainly do some preparation on the pitchers each day and the hitters and, um, and have fun. You know, uh, your audience is comprised of uh, not just people like you. They are people of all ages and genders and their levels of passion vary greatly as well. So um, there's no one way to do it, but be yourself and have fun. That's what I've always told my daughters. Whenever you're starting something, any project, be yourself and have fun. If you do those things, um, try your best, be yourself and have fun. A lot of other things are just going to fall into place. You mentioned the preparation and getting organized. And I was curious what that looks like for you. I know you keep a scorebook, but in terms of anecdotes or specialty stats, trends, how do you organize that? Is it through index cards, legal pad? We know some guys use a computer program. How do you get everything ready to go for a Cubs game? Well, I would say over on the, the margin of my scorecard, I, I have uh, starting lineups all on one sheet. Then I have defensive charts, umpires, and then I have team info, the winning streaks and whatever. And then over on the far right side, uh, I have a, a thing I call topicals. Uh, maybe there was a no hitter pitch last night in Seattle. Some guy has a 25 game hitting streak. Uh, some guy set a baseball record by hitting three triples in one game, whatever it is. I put those over on the right side. Maybe it's something funny that I read where a guy uh, twisted his ankle by trying to avoid being hit by a foul ball in the dugout or whatever something unusual that Ron Coomer and I can have fun with. Those are topicals. And I go to them usually in the middle innings. Uh, the first few innings of a game, I think you're establishing uh, the tempo and you are giving the background. Uh, Anthony Rizzo steps in. He's hitting 282 with 21 home runs. He's driven in 84 as he bats here in the first inning with two men on and has a chance to drive in the game's first run, uh, whatever it is. Uh, and then you have the pitcher background and, you know, he's, he's always done well against the Cubs. Uh, Sonny Gray is five and one lifetime and his ERA is about one against the Cubs or whatever it is. So the first few innings, you're, you're giving the background, the middle innings, you do your history and your fun and your silliness, whatever it is. And then the seventh through the ninth, if the game is on the line, you give people baseball, you give them strategy. It's the eighth inning. It's a tie game. What's the plan here, Ron? And, you know, well, we might bunt. We might hit and run. You know, maybe there's nothing going on. Maybe you just let Chris Bryant have his at bat, whatever it is. So um, it, it, a lot of it is feel. A lot of it is experience. And um, whatever happens at a certain moment, you have to be ready to pivot from where you were to what has just happened on the field. Um, and, and one of the cool things about baseball, you never know when something will come right out of the blue, a triple play, a three run triple, um, a wild pitch where two runs will score like they did on that bizarre play in the World Series. And, and I remember reading about that later in Sports Illustrated, the last time two runs had scored on a wild pitch in World Series play. It was something like 98 years previously. So uh, that's one of the things I love about the game. You never know. The Kerry Wood 20 strikeout game in 1998. Here's a kid making his fifth major league start, and he strikes out a league record 20 men, 20 strikeouts, no walks. 
It was amazing, but it came right out of the blue. So be ready for that. I, I say, be ready for anything, hope for the best, prepare for the worst, and be ready for anything. And then when the ball is put in play, how do you try to manage your pace? One of the things I've always tried to work on in my baseball career is making sure that I, you know, use some periods, don't jam everything in there because I like to get in descriptors and have a lot of words and go really fast, but I'm still trying to slow down uh, even as I get ready for this upcoming season. So how do you try to manage your pace when the ball is put in play and it's a big play? I think that uh, it's, it's very difficult, for example, to describe a three-run double. OK, um, <clears throat> you've got base runners running everywhere. You've got fielders running everywhere. Cutoff men getting in position, base coaches doing their thing. Uh, there is a lot going on. And, and that's one of the difficult things about baseball. You've got moments and moments of inactivity where absolutely nothing is happening. Walks and strikeouts and routine plays. And now all of a sudden you've got frenzied action for about 15 seconds. I would say always prioritize. I remember reading Dick Enberg's book. He said, a good rule of thumb to keep in mind is where is the ball and where is the lead runner? Where is the ball? Where is the lead runner? If you, if you focus on those two guys and uh, those two items and then get back to the other elements later on, generally you're okay but it's not easy it's it's very difficult um you know if a if a cutoff throw gets away cutoff throw bounces away from russell this might allow another run to score whatever it is um but try to keep it under control uh if you try to do too much you're going to mess something up so you know don't get too far ahead of yourself don't anticipate a play uh here comes the throw to the plate it's the throw is going to be in time, but the throw bounces away and coming into score is, uh, you know, Baez or whomever. So don't anticipate, let it happen and then put it into words as quickly and clearly as you possibly can. Uh, what advice would you have for those in the minor leagues who are, it, it is a tough grind and, and you've done that grind as well. You've done minor league baseball and just how tough it is to get to the big leagues this, these days, what kind of word of advice or encouragement would you give to those in the minor leagues right now that are still hoping for that dream to one day call big league baseball? You said these days, it's always been hard. It's always been hard to get to the big leagues. It is, it is the ultimate <clears throat> baseball job, big league baseball announcing. There is no league higher than that. Uh, so it, it's a difficult thing to get, uh, no question about it. I would say continue to practice, get as many games under your belt as you can, polish off all of the rough edges, um, develop if you can, for example, a home run call, uh, a strikeout call, or just some phrases that are your own. Uh, you, can, you can copy from other people, but uh, I always chuckle when I think about the saying, if you copy from one person, it's called plagiarism. If you copy from a lot of different people, it's called research. <laughs> so, you know, you, you can borrow phrases from other people, but at, at, at some point you have to just be yourself. Whatever your language is and your uh, sensibilities are and what your attitude is, that's what you've got to be on the air, no matter what it is be yourself, but practice, practice, do as many games as you possibly can. Uh, I tell young people, they, they want to go into play by play. And I say, well, how many games have you done? None. We'll get out and start doing them. Take a recording device to the American Legion field or the high school baseball field, sit way away from everyone down the left field line in foul territory. Umpires don't like it when you sit in fair territory. Um, and just start practicing your play-by-play. -play. The first time you do it, it's going to seem extremely awkward, but the next time a little less awkward, and so on and so on. But if you're already a minor league baseball announcer, you're on your way. Keep getting better. Make today better than yesterday. Make tomorrow's broadcast better than today. Um, it's a difficult thing, though. Like, I mean, the competition is intense, to, to become a big league announcer, but don't let that bother you. 
anything really worthwhile is going to be difficult. And this will be my final one, Pat, but do you have a favorite road venue that, that you love to call games at? Um, anyone that stands out the most to you? I would say uh, several do. Uh, Dodger Stadium, because you knew you were working up until he retired, you were working the same game that Vin Scully was working. And there was something very cool about that. The Bay Area, that's where I'm from. So anytime the Cubs play the Giants, it's always a thrill. And that's a gorgeous setting, uh, the ballpark right on San Francisco Bay. Uh, and then the Cubs-Cardinals rivalry is a very special thing to me. I love covering Cubs-Cardinals games, whether it's at Wrigley over at, or over at Bush Stadium in Missouri. It's just uh, the atmosphere is, is just remarkable. So those would be the first ones that come to mind. But not to be corny about it, if it's a big league baseball game and it's my assignment, I'm happy to be there. And uh, I never take it for granted, and I hope I never will. And if I do, I probably will have to retire. Well, Pat, before we let you go on Broadcaster Hour, I did want to ask you, you mentioned uh, developing a, a signature home run call and different things like that, and you've got so many signature calls you can go back to, whether it's get out the tape measure, long gone, or this ball's got a chance, gone. Fasten those seatbelts. When did you start developing those, and did the light bulb kind of click the first time you set it on air, or how did you go about all those Pat Hughesisms that we love as Cubs fans? <laughs> Well, it's very nice uh, to, to hear, and, and thanks, Roger and Kyle. You guys have been great, and you're very prepared, and uh, thanks for your kindness. Um, I would say the home run call just kind of evolved um, because I, I used to say, you know, it's got a chance, and it's off the wall. It's got a chance. It's caught at the wall. Uh, you don't want to mislead your audience into having them think it's going to be a home run. So what I'm really doing with it's got a chance, gone. I'm buying that extra second or two to see whether the ball is in fact a home run or if it's off the top of the wall or if a guy makes a leaping catch. I try not to go into that chance unless I'm pretty darn sure it's going to be a home run. So that would be the first thing. But a lot of it just evolves naturally and it comes with experience of doing game after game after game. And all of a sudden you'll just hit on certain things and you'll think, I like that. I'm going to use that again and again. Uh, a leadoff single by Bryant. Let's see if that leads to bigger and better things as Baez steps in. Um, I said it one day and I thought, I like that. Bigger and better things. And let's see if, um, you know, Zobris can intensify this rally or increase the scoring opportunity or likelihood. And, um, you know, there are just little, little things that will happen and you'll think that feels good. I, I like that. Uh, so, it, you know, it's amazing. I've, I've been doing games all these years. People still say, gee, I like the way you describe the uniforms. And to me, that's broadcasting 101. That's back in college when I was at San Jose State. You know, give the color of the uniforms. If you're doing a football or a basketball game, let's let the audience know that uh, the Spartans, the San Jose State Spartans, they're going from left to right as you listen. So you can, in your mind, picture, okay, the quarterback's going back and, and he's making a long pass downfield. It's going left to right. So you're actually seeing the ball uh, and it's, it's the near sideline. It's the far sideline, whatever it is. But I, I, I don't know. It's, it's a, I can't really give advice on uh, what your call might be or what your pet phrases might be. Um, you know, listen to other guys. I try not to copy anybody. I, I really don't. And, and I want people, when they tune into me, I want them to think that's, that's a unique broadcast. That's Pat. You know, he's not trying to be anybody else. He's being himself, whether that's good or bad, he's being himself. And, and that I'm proud of. And I would give that advice to anybody. Be yourself, bring your own intelligence and your own energy and your own playing background and your own sensibilities and your own quirkiness or idiosyncrasies, whatever it is, bring that to the booth and let her rip and have fun, have fun. You know, I, I like to hear somebody that I know is enjoying calling the game because it is a fun job. It's a very difficult job. It's not nearly as easy as people think. Vin Scully made it sound like he was sitting in a rocking chair but that's only because he was so prepared every single day 
to do his job. And he had done, I guess, darn near 10,000 games at the end of his career. So he was relaxed, he was experienced, and he made it sound easy. But that's part of the artwork. It's not easy. A true artist makes it sound easy, but it comes after many, many years. And we're really happy that year number 40 for you in Major League Baseball is coming up soon, Pat. Just thank you so much for joining us on Broadcaster Hour. We've had a lot of fun and we can't wait to hear you once again on Chicago Cubs radio and also hear about you knocking down those jump shots as you stay in shape during the season. But just thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. You're welcome. You're welcome, Roger and Kyle. And uh, they're not really jump shots. I used to jump. Uh, I'm 66. I would say they are tiptoe shots. Larry Bird had, had a good quote. He said, if you have to jump, it's probably not a good shot to take. So he, he would just kind of, you know, go up on, go up on the, on the, the tiptoes as he, as he shot. That's what I've been doing for years. Jump shots, hmm, you, you probably have a hard time sliding a very thin phone book under my feet on my jump shots because I don't, I don't get too airborne these days. But thank you, guys. I enjoyed it, and I hope that uh, I was able to do what you guys wanted on your, on your program. Yeah, as long as those jump shots go in, that's all that matters. Thanks, Pat. Appreciate it. <laughs> that's right. You're welcome, guys. Our thanks to Pat Hughes. Thanks to all of you for watching Broadcaster Hour.